Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, For I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, we thank you for being the way, for being the truth, and being the life. We thank you that salvation is only found in your name, in the name of Jesus. And that's why we see. and the life Would you sing it one last time? And I believe you are the way the truth the life and I believe you are the way the truth the Lord. If you believe that, why don't you give him a loud praise by putting your hands together. He is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to receive the word of God tonight? We thank you once again, and we welcome you. Thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord. We also welcome all of our live stream viewers, those that are watching, you know, through our social media. God bless you. We pray that at this moment, the Lord and through the Holy Spirit would prepare your heart, your mind to receive the word of God. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, which points us to the way. And tonight, Lord God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that we may see the wonderful truths that are found in your word. I pray that you would bless each and every person that... Lord God, is within the sound of the voice of this message, which is your word. And I pray that your word would be planted on good ground and produce a harvest of righteousness for your glory and your honor. And now, Lord, I stand before you and I ask that you give me grace and wisdom to deliver your word in such a way that only you receive all the glory, all the credit, and all the praise. 
Empower me through your Holy Spirit to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say, amen, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, we're going to open up our Bibles tonight to the book of Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. We are excited now to finally be able to start this wonderful, beautiful, powerful psalm. We're going to look at the first eight verses. Last time we met, we gave a, an introduction, a brief introduction to this psalm. And today we're going to give an exposition. We pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. Also, um, may I remind you that this Sunday we once again are going to restart our sermon series in the book of Judges. We're going to be talking about the life of Samson, the birth of a hero, chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, taking verse by verse. And I want you to invite your friends, invite your family. You're going to hear some things about the life of Samson. You've never knew about Samson, but today we're talking about the Word of God. The title of the, today's message is The Way to Blessedness. The Way to Blessedness. Verse 1, blessed are those who weigh, whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Psalms 119 is the giant among all of those psalms. It is the longest chapter and the longest psalm in all of the Bible, containing 176 verses. It is longer than all of the New Testament epistles except the epistle of Hebrews. This is the Mount Everest of all of the psalms. I am very excited to be able to stand before you and preach and expound God's word and I pray that the Holy Spirit would just be glorified and that the Holy Spirit would speak to us through his word. Are we ready to receive the word of God tonight? Amen. Psalms 119, where I remind you, it was written to, to be memorized. Each stanza starts with the first, uh, with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And we're looking at the first stanza, which is the first eight verses. The first eight verses of this Mount Everest of the Psalms basically sets the foundation of what the whole psalm is going to look like. In other words, this, these first eight verses are the cornerstone for the rest of the song. They, they set the mood, they set the stage for us to get a flavor of what the main focus of the psalm is. And the main focus is the Word of God. We explained that last time we met. I want to make it very clear that my intention as that we bring this expo expositional sermon series is to be more devotional, more pastoral, and leaning towards more in an application. Rather than this sounding like a Hebrew grammar lecture or a word study, I want it to be full of, of rich and full of practical daily application. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would prepare our hearts to receive his word. So the Holy Spirit, God gave me the following outline. And if you'd like to take down notes, I would recommend for you to do so. We're going to break this psalm into five divisions. And we're going to talk about these five things. And I pray that the Holy Spirit, as we look at each and every one of these points that are found in, in these first eight verses, that God would speak to us loud and clear. Verse 1 and 2 speak about the delight of God's word. The delight of God's word. Verse 4 speaks about the demand to obey God's word. God demands, God commands for us to obey his word. Verse 5 and 6 basically speak about the desire. The psalmist had a desire to keep God's word. Verse 7 and 8 speaks about the decision to learn God's word. And then the latter part of verse 8 speaks about the dilemma of obeying God's word. The delight, the demand, the desire, the decision, and the dilemma that each and every one of us is going to confront as we 
move forward to obey God's word. So let us look at that first point. Verse 1 of Psalms 119, the delight of God's word. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. If you like to write in your Bible, underline the word blessed, underline the word way, and underline the word walk. The Hebrew word for the word blessed basically means happy. Happy are those who, whose way is blameless. Delightful are those. It's speaking about having complete happiness, overflowing in delight. So when we look at these two Beatitudes that are found in the first two verses, it says, blessed are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who, who walk in the law of the Lord. Uh, King David is basically making a reflection, and he's giving a personal testimony that the way to, to be happy, the way to be truly blessed and truly happy, it comes through obedience in God's word. Obedience produces happiness. And I think that we need to pay very close attention to what David is going to teach us in this psalm. It is man's ultimate desire to be happy. As a matter of fact, if we look at our history, you know, um, we have that in our constitution in pursuit of happiness. That every human being by, by nature has been designed by God, created by God to long for happiness. As a matter of fact, uh, Pascal, one of the great philosophers, he says the following about happiness. All men seek happiness. This is without exception, whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. Every human being wants to be happy. Nobody wants to be miserable. And David says, blessed are those whose way is blameless. Happy are those who walk in God's word. Happiness comes through obedience. Obedience brings happiness. Misery, shame. Depression is a result of disobedience. And David knew that very well. You will never be happier in your life than when you are walking and obeying in God's word. You will never be more happier. Now, when we underline that word way, we will discover that in this psalm, this word is found 13 times. 13 times the psalmist mentions this word, this Hebrew word way, which means path road, journey, course of life, all of life, lifestyle. So David is saying, happy are those who walk blamelessly, who obey the law of God. They're, they're happy. They're full of satisfaction. They're overflowing in delight. Why? Because God's favor, God's blessing is upon them. Obedience is a result. Uh, happiness is a result of obedience. But the problem that we have in our human nature, sinful nature, is that we search for happiness in all of the wrong places. Man seeks after happiness in all of the wrong places. That is the problem, that man tries to define happiness. How can we become happy? How can I be more satisfied? How can I enjoy life to the fullest? And we have many ideas, many philosophies, many ways of thinking. People sometimes will say, you know, in order to be happy, you got to have lots and lots and lots of money. That's what it means to be truly happy, to be truly blessed. Others say to be happy, you got to be powerful. You got to make a name for yourself. You, you, you got to be famous. You got to become a, a celebrity and, and let everyone know who you are. People say to be happy, you got to have all of your dreams and desires and wishes become a reality. That's when you're going to be happy. Some say happiness comes by enjoying your life, living the vida loca, having all the women, and just living life to the fullest without any regrets, without any remorse. Do whatever you want, and you're going to be happy. Some say happiness comes through alcohol, happiness comes through drugs, happiness comes through all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, these people who were looking for happiness in all of the wrong places, they find themselves in an empty hole. They find themselves in depression because happiness comes through obedience. Happiness comes through discovering the way. It says, whose way is blameless. 
So this is the way some people think. Those that have not been saved, you know, this is the way to be happy. And the Bible says something about those people. In the book of Proverbs chapter 12, verse 14, over, where, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. There is a way. It seems right to them. Hey, let's just make more money. Let's do whatever we want. And let's just, you know, enjoy ourselves and do as we please and become famous and do all these things. And then we're going to be happy. But it says that at the end, that seems right at the beginning. But the end result is death and destruction. Still others say that the way to be happy is through religion. You got you to gotta work, you know, your, out your salvation. And it, salvation through works. And we're going to, you know, we're not going to mention any religion by name. But some people think that if I just become a religious person, if I just follow these set of rules, and if I just, you know, you know become religious and self-righteous, then I'm going to be happy. And that's not the way happiness is found. We cannot earn our salvation. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of, from God. Salvation is a gift from God. So happiness is not found in religion. Happiness is found in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion is not the way. The world's way is not the way. You see, the way is a person. Say, blessed are those who walk blameless in his way. The way to happiness is a person. We just sang that song in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that is the way to be happy, is to know the way, to have a relationship with the way, which is Jesus Christ. So what did Jesus mean when he said, I am the way? Well, we can apply that, we can apply that in many ways. And when, when we say that Jesus is the way, he is the way to salvation. He is the way to knowing who God is. He is the image of the invisible God. And when we see Jesus, we see the Father. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what does that mean? It means that Jesus is the way out. Jesus is the way out of sin. Jesus is the way out of depression. Jesus is the way out of drugs. Jesus is the way out of confusion. Jesus is the way out of failure. Jesus is the way out of bondage. People are looking for a way of escape. And if you come to Jesus tonight, and if you're watching through that screen, and you're wanting to find a way out, a way to happiness, come to Jesus. He is the way out. But not only is he a way out, he's also the way in. He's the way into a blessing life he said I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly it says that the thief comes to kill steal and destroy but I have come I am the way to an abundant life he is the way to a blessed life he is the way to a happy life he is the way to a hopeful life he is the way to a joyful life to a loving life to a powerful life he is the way to forgiveness but not only is he the way out, he's the way in, he's also the way up. He's the way to God. He's the way to heaven. He's the way to eternal life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Blessed is the man whose way is blameless, who has found a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come on, let's give him praise and glory. So the way is a person. And the way to happiness is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the way. It's not religion. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. So when we say that Jesus is the way, we're also saying that Jesus is not only the way, but he's also the word, the word. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and one and three, it says, in the beginning was the word, speaking about Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing, no, without him was anything made that was made. 
Jump to verse 14. And the word became flesh. We're talking about the incarnation of Jesus. And he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. So when we're talking about, you know, blessed is the one whose way is blameless. When, when you obey Jesus, you're following the way, but you're also obeying the word. To follow Jesus means to follow the word. I want you to notice with me that the psalmist uses a metaphor in this psalm to describe a style of life. And he uses the metaphor of walking. And we see this word mentioned twice in verse 1 and verse 2. And what he is talking about when he says, a man who walks in the law of the Lord, who delights, you know, himself in the word, it's speaking about life. It's speaking about moving forward step by step in obedience in God's word. But because man is sinful, man that does not know Christ, a person that's not saved, doesn't want to walk with God, doesn't want to obey God, doesn't want to listen to God. Why? Because they're sinful. They have not been born again. So though when we talk about Jesus being the way to the Father and following his word is, is, is the source of true delight and happiness, the world doesn't understand that. The world, the world, as a matter of fact, they reject that. Why? Because they don't want to obey God. They want to obey their own way, their own way of thinking. They don't want, to, they don't want anything to do with the way, with the word. They don't want anything to do with God. Why? Because that's not popular. That's not what they want. You see, if you made a decision tonight to walk in the way, to walk in the word, to obey God, true happiness will become that result of a, per, a result of a person who has made that decision to follow God and obey him. And that's not going to be popular. That's never going to be popular. And you're going to have some opposition. As a matter of fact, Jesus gives us a little bit more light and clarity concerning the way. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy. That leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard. That leads to life. And those who find it are few. It's easy to sleep around and do whatever you want and follow your own ways. It's easy to smoke dope and get drunk and be stupid and get wasted and get locked up in jail and just live the way you want. That's the easy life. And many people follow that way. That's the way to their happiness. But at the end, the Bible says that it leads to destruction. Because there is a way that seems right to man. It seems right to them at that very time. This is the right thing to do. But at the very end, it leads to destruction. That's the easy way. But he says that there's a different way. And it's through the narrow gate. The narrow gate of obedience, of following Jesus. It says that it's hard. It's hard. But it leads to life. It leads to happiness. It leads to be, being blessed and favored by God. It's hard. And we will see that the psalmist recognizes how hard it is to be obedient. But it says that those that follow that way, his way, are blessed. And also says in verse 2 and 3, blessed are those who seek him. Blessed are those who seek, blessed are those who keep his testimonies and seek him with their whole heart. Who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. May I remind you that there are ten synonyms that are equivalent, equivalent to the word of God. Testimonies, precepts, statues, law of God, way, judgments. All of those things that are mentioned in Psalms 119. It's talking about the word of God. It says, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who keep his word, who seek him with all their heart. You know, when you're seeking God with all your heart, that's true satisfaction. You know, God is against a divided heart, a, a wavering heart. As a, as a matter of fact, it says that he's going to spew out of his mouth. He's going to vomit out of his mouth those that have a lukewarm and cold heart. It says you've left your first love. God desires for the believer, for us Christians, to seek him continually constantly with all of our hearts and how do we seek God how do we seek God we seek him primarily through his word listen to the following I'm going to repeat it several times 
We cannot know God apart from his word. We cannot know God apart from his word. We cannot seek God apart from his word. It is through the study, the hearing, the obeying, the practicing of God's word that we're seeking him. God reveals himself to all of humanity through his word. So reject those that say, oh, I, I saw an angel, a spirit. I had a vision. If it's not in the word, it's not God. It was bad pizza or bad burrito that they ate the night before. We basically receive a revelation of who God is, is through his word. Through the word of God, we seek God. Seeking God means much more than reading the Bible or even studying the Bible. It means hearing God's voice in his word, loving him more, and wanting to delight his heart and please him. It means wholehearted surrender. So we surrender to him. We obey his word. And that's exactly what God wants. When we seek him with all of our hearts, you know, tomorrow, Valentine's Day, you know, what if you wrote down on that little H-E-B card, oh, I love you with half of my heart or 10% of my heart. It's going to be a long night for you, a lonely night for you if you do that. It's not going to be a good night. Well, you know, God wants us to love him with all of our heart, to seek him with all of our heart. So when we come to church, we, we, we don't want to come to church half-heartedly. We, we don't want to worship God half-heartedly. We, we, we don't want to serve God half-heartedly. In Spanish, no queremos servir a Dios a medias, sino con todo el corazón. With all of our hearts, that's what God wants. Why? Because it's the greatest commandment. It's the most important commandment. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, verse 37 and 38, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, wholeheartedly, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And when you obey that commandment and you're seeking God, you want more of God, you want to please God, you want to do his will, you want to follow his way, you want to honor God, God blesses you and the joy of your salvation is manifested and you live a blessed life. And all spirit of depression has to leave. Why? Because your delight is in the way of God. The way of God. Are you seeking God with all of your heart? It says blessed are those whose way is blameless. Blessed are those who seek God with all of their hearts. You will never be more blessed than when you come into contact with the way and walk in his way and seek him with all of our hearts. Now, God demands that. In verse 4, the demand to obey God's word. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. So this is not an option. It's not an option. Oh, si quiero. If I feel like it, no. It's not if, if si lo siento, si quiero, if I feel like it, no. It, it's, it's a demand. It says you have commanded your precepts to be kept. You have commanded your word to be kept. Obedience is not an option. Disobedience, not keeping God's word. Is sin, is rebellion. Now notice with me, the standard that God sets on how you and I are to obey the word of God, how we, you and I are to walk in the way of God, in the word of God, says they are to be kept diligently. What does that mean? It means that they are to be kept carefully. They are to be kept attentively. They are to be kept thoroughly. They are to be kept meticulously. They are to be kept precisely. They are to be kept exactly. They are to be kept always 24-7. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to read the Old Testament because that's scary. And we're no longer under the law, the, the Ten Commandments. It's all grace. No! It says that he has commanded his precepts, all of his word, plural precepts, to be kept diligently, carefully, attentively, thoroughly, meticulously, precisely, exactly, to be kept always 24-7. And guess what? King David, being a righteous person filled with the Holy Spirit, he recognized how hard that was. And this is what he says. What his desire was in verse 5. He, we now move in transition. Verse 5 and 6. To the, the desire to keep God's word. 
David says, all that my ways may be steadfast and keeping your statues. David knew that he was falling short. That he was not always following God and obeying God attentively, carefully, you know, precisely, exactly. He said, he, there's a longing here. This is a cry of weakness. Oh, how I wish, how I wish I was like that. Obeying God diligently, carefully, exactly. Oh, how I wish that my ways were steadfast. How I wish I was like that. Obeying God. The word steadfast means fully committed. It means fully dedicated. The word steadfast means to follow the word of God precisely, consistently, to be committed. And you know what? This is the attitude of every Christian. How do you know if you're a Christian or not? Do you pray like this? Do you long to obey God's word? When you don't obey God's word, when you don't keep God's word diligently, do you feel upset at yourself? Or you're like, eh, I don't care. It doesn't bother you. If it doesn't bother you, that alarm of the sound of the Holy Spirit's conviction is not sounding in your heart, then you ought to question your salvation. Because David shows us the path, the way to a blessed life, the longing of a Christian that loves God. He wants to keep God's word all the time, precisely, exactly, not editing the Bible, because we don't have the right to edit the Bible. So many people just highlight what they want to highlight. They skip all the scary passages or the passages that point out their sin and their flaws. No, he says, oh, that my ways were steadfast. If you really love God, you're going to pray like that. Why? Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And when you don't, you're going to pray like David. Oh, God, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I lied again. Oh, I found myself gossiping or hating him or her in my heart. Oh, God, I messed up. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit arrests your heart. You feel bad. And David knew that he fell short. He said, oh, that my ways were steadfast, that I were fully committed. And David says in this expression of thought, he's saying, I I'm weak. See, David is recognizing that by himself, he doesn't have the power to obey God's word. By himself, he cannot fully keep God's word. And now David speaks about the consequences in verse 6 of not obeying the word of God. We all got to pay close attention to verse 6. And we'll park there for a moment. It says, then I shall not be put to shame. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all of your commandments. Why does he speak about shame? Because when we don't keep God's word diligently, sin produces shame. El pecado produce vergüenza. Sin produces shame. Shame is the fruit of sin. Confidence is the effect of righteousness. Sin produces shame. Why? Because there's guilt. There's condemnation. There's embarrassment. How do you know when someone is not living according to God's word? They're living a life of shame. We see that in the book of Genesis, with the first act of disobedience, God told Adam and Eve, hey, of all the trees of the garden you may eat, but except this one, we all know the story. They both disobeyed. And what happened immediately after they disobeyed the word of God? Shame, guilt, and condemnation set in their hearts. And the Bible says that they tried to cover themselves. Why? Because sin produced shame. Before the fall, the Bible says that they were naked and not ashamed. After the fall, when they disobeyed, when they rebelled, when they sinned against God, did not follow his commandment diligently, that produced shame. And you know what? Sometimes we don't realize that we're talking to people around us that are living a life of shame. They have a guilty conscience that is haunting them. And how do we know when a person 
has become, you know, has, has fallen into that state of shame. The first thing, when a person is ashamed, they hide. We, one of the first symptoms that we see in the church, and I'm talking to the Christian, is that one of the symptoms that we see when people fall into sin willfully is that they first start to hide themselves among the brethren. They stop coming to church. Why? Because they're trying to cover up something. And they stop the, the, the attendance of church. They stop coming to church. Why? Because there's something that they're not proud about. There's something that has caused shame in their life. They stop serving. And they start to try to cover up that shame. And when you have some kind of interaction with them and you ask, Hey, where you been? We missed you at church. You weren't at the Bible study. You were at the... Man oh, no, I'm all right. God is good all the time. And those are just leaves, verbal leaves that they use to cover their shame. It's a facade. But deep down inside, shame has set in. You know, this is very powerful. When David wrote this, says that those, then I shall not be put to shame. David was a man who knew what shame was all about. The Bible tells us that he was a man after God's own heart, but he failed miserably. He lied, he committed murder, he committed adultery, and his sin, and his shame, his, his sin became shame in his life. It brought shame to his life. It brought shame to his kingdom. It brought shame to his family. And David knew that sin produces shame. But that's not the way Satan presents sin. Satan says, it's fun. Do it. Nobody's going to have, nobody's going to find out. You don't have to keep everything carefully, precisely. It's all grace, bro. It's all God's love will cover that. But then when you do that, you understand that shame comes in. And then you feel guilty. And you start to cover that guilt up because you're hiding. You see, sin is very deceptive. The Bible tells us that, yeah, sin feels good. And it's fun for a season. Satan says, sin, don't worry about it. It's okay. The consequences won't be that bad. No one's going to find out. But when they find out, you don't even want to show your face around. As a matter of fact, people delete their social media accounts. They delete themselves out of Facebook because they're so shameful. The whole world knows. And the world is pointing the finger, shame on you. And then the devil is laughing. Ah, <laughs> you dummy. You, you believed it. You see, sin, it thrills. Then sin kills. Sin fascinates. And then it assassinates. Sin plays. And then you have to pay. Sin's games bring life's ultimate shame. And if you're playing with sin, your sin will find you out. And David recognized that. He says, Lord, if I don't keep your word diligently, he says, then if I do, I won't be put to shame because I'm going to have my eyes fixed on your commandments. So tonight, if you're living a life of shame, come to the acknowledgement of your sin. And now David moves us and he transitions his thought in poetic expression to a decision, which is the fourth point. Verse 7 and 8, the decision to learn God's word. I will praise, David says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. I will obey your word. David made an important decision. He knew what shame was all about. He knew what it felt not to keep God's word diligently. But listen, he made two important decisions. He made two decisions. He says, I will learn God's word. And I also will learn to keep God's word. I will obey God's word. So David made a decision to learn the word of God. And David made a decision to obey the word of God. Learning and obedience go hand in hand. We can't have just be, become students of the word and never obey the word, have intellectual knowledge and know all of this scripture and know how to interpret the Greek, the Hebrew, and know how to exegete and parts verses and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, you're not living the word. They're not the seed of it. It's useless. It's, it's futile. You're, you're just deceiving yourself, becoming a hearer of the word of God and not a doer. So David made a decision. He says... I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules, when I learn your word. 
See, David had an attitude of wanting to grow, wanting to learn, wanting to study. The word learn here, the, he, the Hebrew word learn here is the word lamad, which is mentioned 12 times in this Psalm 19, 119. It means to study, to learn, to hear. David had the desire to learn and study the word of God. That was his desire. Listen, to a man after God's own heart. Why was he a man after God's own heart? Because he loved the word. He wanted to grow in the word. He wanted to know more God. You see, the more we learn about the word, the more knowledge we will have about God, who he is and what he wants to do. Without learning his word, we will never discover his will for our lives. David was a wise man. He wrote most of the Psalms, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write all of these Psalms. He knew the word. He was inspired by the word, but he had a longing and he made a decision to learn the word of God. How smart was David? Let's look at verse 98 and verse 100 that describes who, how smart David was. But yet he wanted to grow. He wanted to learn. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the age, for I have kept your precepts. In spite of all of these things that David was inspired to write the word of God, he wanted to learn. Why? Because when you learn the word of God, that will cause praise in your heart. When you discover something in God's word, and I've been hearing the word of God since I was five years old. You know, I used to love to sit in the front row here. My dad preached. And, I, and I've been 12 years. I have 12 years of seminary, master's degree. I'm three years away from a, from a doctoral degree. But I still feel like I don't know anything. And I discover something. Man, sometimes I come out of my office and my house. I tell my wife, wow, I just... I just figured out what verse 3 meant. I heard it all my life, but look, this is what it means. It causes you to praise. It says that David was a man of praise and worship because he had an upright heart because that was produced by continual studying and learning and hearing the word of God. Praiseless Christians are Christians that are no longer in the word. You see, when you're in the Word, you're growing in the Word, you're hearing the Word, you're studying the Word, you're learning the Word, you're growing, and that produces praise. That produces joy. And David says, I'm going to make a decision. I will learn your Word. But not only that, he said, I will also keep your Word. I will keep your Word. He says, I will keep your statutes, verse 8, the first part of verse 8. I will keep your statutes. Why? Because we can't just be hearers of the word. we got to be doers of the word. They both go hand in hand. You see, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, Paul knew the problem of those that are always learning and never able to acknowledge or to come to the knowledge of truth. They know a lot about the Bible, and they can tell you all about the Torah and all about the Exodus and who was Pharaoh and, and what time uh, calendar it was. It was B.C. this, and they know all this, but at the end of the day, are you obeying the Word of God? Because if you have all this knowledge, you're walking encyclopedia, you're a Google Bible, but you're not obeying, it's futile, it's dumb. You're deceiving yourself. So David says, I'm going to be learning. I'm going to be praising. I make a decision. But also I make a decision to obey the word of God. I don't want to just always be learning and never coming to the acknowledgement of the truth. You see, when you obey the word, when you heed the word, when you follow the word, walk in the word, that is when you come to the knowledge of the truth. True knowledge is when you put it into practice. True knowledge is when you walk it out step by step. I will walk in his commandments. That's what true knowledge is. Otherwise, you're just a big watermelon with a lot of seeds in your head, and you know it all, but at the end of the day, you're still disobedient. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips. They honor me quoting scripture right and left, but their hearts are far from me. David didn't want that. Now notice with me, last point of the sermon. The dilemma. The dilemma of obeying God's word. David says, I will keep your statutes. I will keep your word. But then he ends with a prayer. He makes a decision, but then he calls out to God in prayer. Do not utterly forsake me. David is acknowledging that he can't do this by himself. David is acknowledging 
that he's inadequate. He's powerless to, to, to fulfill that decision to learn and to obey the word of God and keep it diligently. He says, God, don't let me go. God, help me. Don't abandon me. Don't forsake me. Jesus, I need you. Jesus said, without me, you cannot do anything. He says, don't forsake me. I need your help. Please, Lord, don't abandon me. Don't forsake me. I need your strength to walk a blameless life, to follow your truth, to keep your word, to fulfill my decisions. God, I need your strength. Don't forsake me. He said, the blessed person. Is the person who recognizes that he or she is unable to follow God, honor God, walk in his will, and obey his word without the help of God. We need God. The blessed person is the person that recognizes his or her weakness. Christians that think, oh, I'm saved 30 years and Wow, they, they, never, they never show any kind of weakness. They think they know it all and you, don't, you can't teach them. You know, those are the Christians that many times are self-righteous and hypocritical in their style of life. But the true Christian says, man, I know I messed up. I screwed this up, man. And that's why I need God. God, forgive me. God, don't forsake me. I will keep your commandment, but don't abandon me. I don't want to go if your presence doesn't go with me. Later on, David also prays a similar prayer in another psalm that he wrote, Psalms 86, verse 11. David says to God, teach me your way that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. He says, teach me your way. I want to learn. I want to learn your word, God. But not only do I want to learn, I want to walk it out step by step. I want to obey it. I, I want to walk in your truth. But then he says, unite my heart. The same words in verse 2. I don't want a divided heart. I don't want a, a faithless heart, a wavering heart. I want to be wholehearted to fear your name with all my heart. Unite my heart. I don't want my heart to be divided. I don't want my heart to have um, loyalties over here and here and be disloyal to you. But unite my heart, Lord God, to fear your name. David was a man after God's own heart. But he needed the help of God to have that heart. And if you're a true Christian tonight, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And you have not kept his word of God, the word of God carefully, carefully, diligently, meticulously. You failed. And you need to come to God and say, God, I messed up. But I want to make that decision. Notice with me. Notice with me the genius of the Hebrew literature that is before, before us. Notice with me that the first stanza starts with two beatitudes. Blessed is the man. Blessed are those whose way is blameless who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Blessed. Two blessings. It starts with two blessings, and it ends with two decisions. Verse 7 and 8. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Two blessings. God guarantees a blessing if we walk in his ways, if we obey his word. Two times, bless, bless, bless. But you got to make that decision. Tonight, you're at a crossroads. You got to make that decision. Will you walk in his ways? Will you obey his word and live a life of happiness and blessings? Or will you decide to turn your back on God and allow the, the, the shame of sin to take hold of your life. You make that decision. Do you want to live a shameful life that doesn't honor God? Or will you make that decision? Say, God, I haven't kept your word diligently. Oh, that my ways were steadfast. That's what I want, God. That's my prayer. I need your help. So don't let me go. I want your presence. I can't do this alone. Don't utterly forsake me. Let's stand to our feet tonight. If, you've not made, if you have not made the decision to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today is the day of your salvation. The beautiful thing about the gospel is that the gospel is a gospel of God's grace, mercy, forgiveness. If you come to Jesus, he'll wash your shame away. 
He'll remove all spirit of culpability, all spirit of condemnation, all spirit of guilt. The blood of Jesus can cleanse you, can wash you of all of your sin. That's God's grace. You don't have to do anything. All you need to do is recognize that you've done wrong before God. Recognize that you've fallen short of God and say, God, I've messed up. I've lived a sinful life, and I recognize that you are the way to heaven. You are the way to eternal life. There's no other way. It's not through religion. It's through a relationship in the way, which is Jesus. Make that decision. You see, if you don't, there's going to be ultimate shame. In the book of 1 John, we are told that many will be ashamed at his appearing. Many will be ashamed. He says, enter through the narrow gate. It's hard. I tell you, it's hard for me, pastor of this church. I'm in the word every day, and it's still hard. I'm not above you. I need as much of the Holy Spirit as you need the Holy Spirit. It's hard. But the Bible says it leads to life. If you want the other way, the easy way, well, then do whatever you want. But it leads to shame. It leads to destruction. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to live but through Jesus. He brings true delight, satisfaction, and happiness. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, what a joy, what a delight. Lord God, we've just scratched the surface of the wisdom that is found in your righteous, holy word. Father, I pray that right now this word would produce fruit in all of our lives. Father, awaken those that have not kept your commandments diligently, that have made a decision to edit things out of their life that are found in the Bible right now. Bring conviction in their hearts. Conviction that will lead them to repentance. Conviction that will lead them to salvation. Recognize that you haven't followed God's ways carefully. He commands us. It's not an option. It's not if I want to, if I feel to. No, he commands us to keep his ways diligently. But you can't do that alone. You need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So say, God, that my ways were like that. I want to make that decision. I don't want to live a life of shame. I want to learn your word. I want to grow in your word. I want more of you. Help me, Lord. Come to me, Jesus. As you know, the altar is always open to those who desire to come and pray. Or if you need prayer, we have some prayer partners that would love to pray for you. Why don't we worship the Lord and worship him for his word.
I love 